Amen. Amen. Well, have you been complaining a lot lately? Have you been complaining a lot lately? Have I been? And uh, if you have, how does it sound? How's it coming out? Uh, one of my favorite things about marriage is you can't get away with complaining. And if I'm honest, uh, recently, just Thursday, I love how God gives me sermon illustrations every week to bridge the gap between real life and the scriptures. And I thought I was doing pretty good. Actually, if I'm honest, I, was, I thought I was like, man, you know, God's got it. I'm gonna just go with it. I can't control that. I'm not gonna complain. But Thursday was a different story. It was trash day at the Dachshund household. And if you remember, and if you're online in South Florida, this doesn't apply to you, but here in the Midwest, on Thursday, we had a north wind at about 25 miles an hour, and it felt like seven degrees. And foolishly, well, how do I say this? Lovingly, my wife says, hey, don't forget the trash. And so I have shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops on, thinking, no problem, dude. Just bring those out real quick. Yeah, like embrace the cold. We're going to be good. So I hurry out. I got, you know, you know how you have the recycle and you have the other one? Well, for whatever reason, we had a lot of people over this past week, so they're just overflowing. You know what I'm saying? When the, when the garbage is like, it's not shut, but it's like, it's going to do one of these numbers. You know what I'm talking about? And so I'm, I'm running out there. It's cold. I was like, why am I in Omaha? Like, <laughs> give me back to Fort Lauderdale. Charlotte somewhere, get me out of here. And so I get it out there, and then the, the top just, and guess what, you know what happened after that? All the recycle boxes. I'm the Christian, my neighbors know it. There's no way I can litter and just let it go. There's even a dumpster right there. I was like, ah, oh, maybe they just throw it in the dumpster. Oh, they're getting me on video, and then I'm gonna get incarcerated for putting it, like you can't do it. So, dude, I, I'm literally, I'm, ru I'm running in flip-flops, ah, grabbing, just collating boxes, and then I, I'm like, do I put them back in there? If they're just going to fly out again. I, what do I do? Ah, and I ran back in the garage. This is pastor confession. I went into the door. My wife, I, I was tearing up because of the wind. She thought I had got hurt. I come in, I was like, I'm tired of this. I just chucked the boxes in my living room. I'm like, I'm out of here. It's terrible. <laughs> like you would think the pastor would be like, now, thank you, Lord, for your provision. All these boxes had resources in them. We were able to bless, have a good time. Glory to the Lord. Put on a parka, idiot. Put on some boots, something that's different. <laughs> Anybody? Is that just me sometimes where you lose it? My wife's praying like the demons out of me and stuff. She's like, get out of us. She leaves. I'm, you know, getting knocked out some personal stuff. You thought it was going to end with that. Sorry, I got I to insert this as well. Because if you didn't relate to that, you'll relate to this. You ever have a bill that's a recurring bill that you called to cancel, but it continues on and you don't know how it did it? This security system from a house we sold a year and a half ago was still charging us $68 a month. Found out, glory to God. <laughs> they might even have a picture of this. Only just be just quick. It was, look, look at how long I was on. Do you see it? Read it real quick. Talk to me, talk to me. How long was I on customer service? And how many people sent me back and forth? Seven. I'm not complaining, though. That's how God, here's the thing. You pray for patience. He's like, I'm not going to just give you patience. I'm going to give you an opportunity to grow in patience. Thank you, Lord. I was, I was reading about complaining, and Jude had me convicted. Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter, but verse 16. These people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their desires. 
It's like, dude. That's me. And it's one thing if it's the cold and the wind and customer service and systems that are off. We We can all laugh and joke, but what about when you just went through the worst tragedy of your entire life? Then what? How do you handle it? Can you, can, you, can you complain to God? Anybody have a complaint against God? You've walked through something, or how about you have a question for God, right? Raise your, like, and I think that there's this interesting tension between can I complain, can I not? If I do, what does it look like? And we see this in Job. And remember, if you're just new with the book of Job, Job, the richest dude in the East, in the worst day of his life, loses everything. All of his belongings, all of his material possessions, his 10 kids. There was this interesting interaction between God and Satan This I still can't understand. And Satan gets into the... At this heavenlies, and he's like, you know, the only reason really Job is, is following you, is fearing you, is because you've blessed him. But if, you know what, if you allow me to take away his possessions, he'll curse you to your face. And God says, okay, you're on. Which I still, to this day, I'm just like, what? So he does, he takes it away. And then, after that, God, Job doesn't curse. And so, then, God allows Satan to attack his person, and he has these painful boils from head to toe. Surely he's going to curse you. That, and he still does, and I'm like, what? This heavenly wager is going on. And then, of course, last week, you know, the friends show up, remember? What, what did I tell you? Like, if you're a friend, what, what's the first thing you do? You show up and you, sorry that I said that in church, but that's what you do. And they had it good for a while, for a week, and then what? They started opening their mouth, accusing Job. So there's this dialogue back and forth, right? You have Job pouring out his heart, his complaint, asking questions, and then these counselors, his friends, giving bogus answers, and you know, I gave you a kind of the spoiler alert, the beauty is at the end, God shows up and was like, all right, Job, prepare yourself like a man, I got some questions for you. Job passes the test, even though there's this dicey dialogue. I was thinking about this. Would you, where are my parents at real quick? Raise your hand real quick. Okay. Would you rather have your kids ask you some questions that kind of feel a little demeaning and a little disrespectful, but they get it out of their heart? Or would you rather have them just stuff it? Huh. If you don't hear anything else, I just want to say, I believe God wants you to get it out. That's the title of the message. Let it out. Let it out. And you go, hey, it's going to get ugly. Okay, God's big. It's the beauty. When Jesus came, he came to be acquainted with our weaknesses and our grief. He's patient. He's a good father. And so I was thinking about this. I was praying. I was looking at the scriptures. And I just want to share a couple thoughts as you and I complain, as we pour out our heart, our complaint before God. Here's a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, jot this down. If you're, if you're a note taker, jot this down. If you're not a note taker, jot it down anyways. Do it right here. Number one, complain, but don't curse. Complain, but don't curse. Job chapter 10, starting in verse one. Here's what Job says. I'm disgusted with my life. Let me, what does it say, church? Let me complain freely. My bitter soul must complain. And this hit me. I will say to God, not say to my friend, not say, I'm going to say to God. I'm going to talk to God. I'm pouring out my heart to God. I'm going vertical. I will say to God, don't simply condemn me. Tell me the charge you are bringing against me. And then drop down a little bit, now to verse eight. Listen to Job 10, verse eight. You formed me with your hand. Now, his, it's so cool because Job's theology is like back and forth. Have you noticed it? He's spot on right here. Listen to what he says. 
You formed me with your hands, you made me. Psalm 139, right? You made me, yet now you completely destroy me. Verse nine, is actually Satan, right? He didn't know that. Verse nine, remember that you made me from dust. Is that theologically sound? According to Genesis chapter one, absolutely. You made me from dust. Will you turn me back to dust so soon? Complain, but don't curse. He's complaining. I find it so interesting that Satan and his wife said curse God. And he complains, but he never curses God. He says some tough stuff. Have you read it? Didn't you feel kind of like awkward when you're reading it? You're like, Job, I'm not so sure you should say that right there. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading that. I was like, yo, you know, like when someone starts complaining like that, you're like, mm, doo, 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 doo. <laughs> like lightning bolt. This thing is just going to like complain, but don't curse. Let me ask you a question. In your complaining to God, are you complaining or you're cursing? This is, a, this is a big, big deal. One of my heroes of the faith who went home to be with the Lord, um, his name's Pastor Steve, and him and Mindy lead, they, they led this ministry called Fresh Start, and we've gone with them to different countries, and in fact, that's what we're bringing, one of the things we're bringing to Guatemala, and Fresh Start really is helping people prayerfully process issues in their heart. Loss, tragedy, offense, hurt, abuse. And many times we stuff it. We don't process it through prayer with the Lord. And then it comes out in horrible ways throughout our life. We don't know how to cope. And so this whole fresh start process. And there's this process. It's like six part kind of like, you know, hey, you know what happened. You're real with it. And you move. And there's this place that you get in this process called pour out your heart. It's, it's, it's process. Everybody put a four up in the air, right? This is this, this idea of I'm just going to pour out my heart. And I asked Mindy for permission. And uh, Pastor Steve wants to preach a two minute message at Love Church from heaven real quick. Are you guys okay with that? So check this out. I want him to articulate the heart. Pour out your heart is the first part of part four. Actually, part four is a two-part section. I like to refer to it with the big idea in mind. And here's the big idea. The big idea is go vertical. Go vertical. And as a part of going vertical, it starts with pour out your heart. And then it continues on with giving thanks. But let's talk first of all about pour out your heart. Notice the scriptures, pour out your heart to the Lord. It says in Psalm 62, eight, trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your hearts to him. Now sometimes people that I've talked to have had a question, uh, you know, the question about this and a concern about this and they say, you know, this sounds like I'm complaining to God and, you know, you know, what if I really am upset with him? I don't want anything to do with him. You're asking me to pour my heart out to God. I'm mad at him. And I say to them, I share with them, I'm so glad you're being honest. I'm so glad you're sharing how you feel. That matters. That matters to him. So maybe that's going to be what you're going to be pouring out to him. And at that point, they may say, okay, I'll tell him. I'm mad at you, God. Why are you letting this happen? It's been 10 years now. This marriage is not even a marriage. It's painful. Is this my life sentence? Or a rebellious child or a health issue? Why, Lord? I thought you loved me. I believe his attitude is, tell me more. Reminds me of what it says in Psalm 142, verses 1 and 2. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell my trouble. King David, so many times in the Psalms, he was <laughs> pouring out distress. <laughs> but... He always landed in a good place, didn't he? He always settled. His heart always settled 
going vertical. Let's give it up for Pastor Steve from heaven speaking to Love Church. Pour out your heart. Psalm 62, 8. Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. I'm not sure where you're at. I've heard several stories recently of tragedy. Just on our small group, just this week, we, we heard two stories. One was first time one of my friends actually, he came to the group. His wife works at a hospital and one of her friends lost a baby after one, the baby was, was alive one day and then passed away. What do you do in that case? It's not trash going, it's, it's your child. How do you process? How do you pour out your heart? Can you be mad at God? Can you question God? What does this look like? You pour it out. You complain, but you don't curse. Another one of our friends told us the story of a seven-year-old with leukemia who they thought he beat it and then this week almost lost his life. They had to resuscitate him to keep him alive. What do you do in that case? Do you stuff it? Well, God's good. He's in control. Do you lose your mind and start cursing God and turn your back on him? What do we do? This interesting tension of life, God is good, he's sovereign. How do I work through this process? Lord, I don't understand, I'm angry, Lord, why? So we complain, but we don't curse. Number two, we cry out, but we don't condemn. We cry out, but we don't condemn. Pastor Steve alluded to, to King David, and we're gonna get into the Psalms, so it's gonna be good. And I love King David, because he was raw. He's real, the dude pours out his heart, and he loses his mind, and then somehow at the end of the psalm, he's like, but I still trust you, God. You know what I'm saying? I love that humanity that we see. You can be raw and real with God. He, he cries out. <laughs> this, I was reading about King David when King Saul, go, do you remember King Saul? Like This phenomenally gifted king, and then he gets jealous of old Davy boy. The shepherd boy comes up on the scene. Remember the, in the song that the ladies were singing? Now Saul kills his thousands, but David, his ten thousands, and Saul's like, gets all jealous. And homie's like taking a spear and trying to chuck it and kill Davy boy. Dave's like, bro, I'm trying to help you. What you trying to kill me for? Remember that? And so out of that whole process, the dude goes to the cave of Adullam. He has to flee for his life, and in the cave, he cries out. That he, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. You know what? It's very possible. You might just be pleading for the Lord's mercy in this season of your life. I don't understand it. In fact, I'm mad, God, but I'm just pleading your mercy. I'm crying out to you, but I'm not putting you on trial. I'm not taking you to court. I'm not condemning you, God, but man, I, if I'm really honest, my guts are ripped to shreds over what's happening in my life right now. Can I be that honest with you, God? And I would say that's healthy. That's healthy. In Job chapter nine, verse three, I was reading this. I was like, oh, listen to what it says. Job nine and three. If someone wanted to take God to court, would it be possible to answer him even once in a thousand times? For God is so, what does it say, church? So wise and so, who has ever challenged him successfully? Here's the thing. As we're crying out, we gotta know God. We gotta know his attributes. I was reminded of that. One of my good friends and I are walking through the one-to-one -one discipleship book over omelets on Saturday mornings, and it's been the greatest time that I've had in a long time. Sounds weird, but when you get a Bible and a bro and some omelets and some good coffee, something happens. And so we're walking, through, and session two is all about the attributes of God. And I just wanted to throw these up for everybody real quick. Um, I don't know if they got that, that graphic. Did they, did they throw? Look at this. When you're reminded, when I'm reminded of who God is, I'm not gonna take him to court. I'm gonna submit to his sovereignty. He's sovereign. 
He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. And I never know if is it omnipotent or omnipotent. Anybody know? I'm just going with omnipotent, okay? What does that mean? All powerful. He can do whatever he wants. I can't. Eternal, omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. As he sends the Holy Spirit, he's with us at all times. And then immutable, he never changes. I change by the minute, by the millisecond sometimes. Talking about, yeah, I'm going to read my Bible, and then I'm going to lose my mind over stuff flying over through my neighborhood. God, God's, God's, he doesn't change. So here's the thing. If I'm going to cry out, and then all of a sudden I'm going to condemn God, I become the judge, and I become sovereign. Fill in the blank rope. And this works for me because it rhymes. Here's how I say it a lot of times to myself. I'm Todd, not God. So here's what we're going to do, a practice. You're just going to say, I'm your first name. All, we're all doing this together. It's going to be helpful for you. And you wish your name was Todd because it rhymes and everything, but for this, this illustration, sorry, it's not going to rhyme. On the count of three, we're going we're gonna to say, I am, and you're going to say your name, and you're going to say, not God. So I'm not, I am Kevin, I'm not God. You guys ready? One, two, three. I am Todd, not God. Let it settle. Here's the problem in our world. I want to be God as a human. I set what's truth and what's not truth. We don't go by the Bible as our foundation. We go by what I feel or what I think. And now we don't have absolute truth. We have this, this, this changing truth. What's true for me is true for you. And we have this moral relativism. And now what happens? I become God. And, and, and listen, listen trying to help someone. I'm not trying to condemn. I'm trying to help. That is taxing because we're trying to control things we can't control. And now there's so much chaos in my life. And I, and I, and again, please, please hear me. I don't know what it feels like to lose a child after one day. I, I'm not, I, we need to cry out. But the minute I start becoming God, things unravel in my life, I don't take him to court. In Job chapter nine, verse 14, he gets to this point. He says, so who am I <laughs> that I should try to answer God or even reason with him? Even if I were right, I'd have no defense. I could only plead for mercy. And at the end of nine, verse 32, chapter, or Job nine thirty-two says, God is not a mortal like me, so I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. As I was praying through this, I was thinking, isn't it a wild thing that even when I make the mistake of trying to take God to trial, Jesus is my advocate actually interceding on my behalf to the Father saying, please forgive that knucklehead. Can I show it to you? Jot it down. This is powerful scripture. First John 2 and 1. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate. We have the attorney right there who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who's truly righteous. Now, that's powerful. I'm trying to take him to court, and yet Jesus is interceding for me for that sin. If you've been in that, I'm trying to be the judge. You repent of that. God, I submit to your sovereignty. I'm deeply wounded, and, and I'm... I have a painful heart. I, I, I don't understand. This is chaotic, and I'm very frustrated, but God, somehow you're sovereign. I'm going to submit to your sovereignty. See how this works. We talked about weeping and worshiping. We talked about grieving and glorifying. This is this, this, this process that we walk through with pain. Complain, don't curse. Cry out, don't condemn. Number three, check this out. This is the last one. Question, but don't quit. Question, but don't quit. God's big enough for your questions. Sometimes I think we're like, man, I don't want to dishonor God, so I won't ask a question. I say he's big enough. But don't quit. 
So many people are leaving the faith right now because they can't make sense of all the chaos and, and what happens. The fruit of that is tragic. Job, Job 9 in 4 says this, God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Watch this. Who has hardened himself against him or quit and prospered? Do you know how many people go through the worst tragedy of their life? They get mad at God. In fact, I don't even believe God anymore. And then I move away from him. And what ends up happening over time, the bitterness of soul and being overwhelmed just brings them into this crippled position and they miss out on God's best for their life. That, as hard as it is, I'm, I'm preaching to someone, maybe they're online, and, and that's what has happened in your life. I'm mad at God. I'm quitting. I'm just quitting Christianity. I'm leaving the church. I'm leaving God. And, and if you're really honest with yourself, if it's just been weeks or months or maybe even years, this is what's happened to your life. God says, repent, come back. Or maybe you're on the verge of quitting right now. Can I just tell you, don't quit. You know how many times I've been so close to tapping and I'm so grateful that God has given me grace and mercy in those weak times. Say, Todd, don't quit, come back, let's go. I got work for you to do. I was thinking of this. Uh, we can have questions. You can ask why. In fact, just a quick, quick little poll. Who came out of the womb asking why? <laughs> Raise your hand. My wife, for sure. Take two hands and put them up, babe. Like, why? 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 It's like that two-year-old, why? Why? Why is the sky blue? Why is... Oh, oh, Lord, have mercy. Like, and we had twins, and Zion came out with the anointing of Denise. Super inquisitive. I'm like, brethren, like, I, why is the speaker at work? We, I got subs in the back. The kids are like four bumping. I, why is it? What's... It, Thank God I had Blaze, because Blaze and I were like, we're not why people, we're like, when? When's dinner? Like, that's, that's, that's who we were. It's like, just show up. I don't care how you cooked it. As long as it's good, I'm eating it. And that's, everybody's got their gifts, okay? In Job chapter 10, verse 3, he says, what do you gain by oppressing me? This is Job asking questions to God. Why do you reject me, the work of your own hands, while smiling on the schemes of the wicked? And then in Job 13, chapter 13, verse 23, just jot these down. I know I'm going through them a lot, but I only have a certain amount of time. Job 13 and 23, tell me, what have I done wrong? Show me my rebellion and my sin. Verse 24, what does it say, everybody? Why do you turn away from me? Why do you treat me as your enemy? Do you know Jesus himself asked questions? How about this? Jesus asked questions, but he didn't quit. I'll prove it to you. <laughs> Matthew 27 and 46, when he's on the cross about the ninth hour, which by the way, Prayer and fasting, pretty powerful. The Jews prayed, I think it was like the third and the ninth hour. Go watch and see all the miracles that happened in those two. Sorry, uh, ADD. But the ninth hour, Jesus cried out. He cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. You like that? That is, my God, my God. Here it is, what does it say? This is Jesus the Son talking to Jesus the Father on the cross, talking about why have you forsaken me? Is it okay for you to say the same thing? Jesus did himself. But here, here's the key, stay with me. On that cross, he didn't quit. And how many grateful that Jesus didn't tap out at that very moment where he took the sin of the entire world upon him. He conquered sin and death. He, he questioned, but he didn't quit. And that's the challenge to us. It's so tough. And again, man, y'all are just looking at me, and, and, and I get it. If I'm a pastor, you haven't lost a child. You haven't. We, Mike and I met with a guy, um, was three days away from seeing his dream come true of playing professional football. His dad, at the age of like 56, passes away randomly three days before he takes his first snap as a professional football player. 
easy for me to say, Todd, you haven't, that hasn't happened. But I'm just speaking truth and, and I'm trying to be sensitive here, but I'm trying to help. And let me just land with this. There's so much to tell you. We grow through our pain. We mature through our pain. We can purpose our pain. Easy for you to say, Todd, I get it. My mentor, Pastor Steve, preached this message for a lifetime. And a lot of people were, when he came down with this diagnosis of, of basically a grueling, just a, a disease that would take his body over and, and bring him to heaven, I'm talk about question, why God? The guy's helping so many people. Selfishly, I'm like, dude, if it wasn't for Pastor Steve, I wouldn't be here right now. Why? Why? I'm asking why. And you know what Pastor Steve was talking about? Submit to his sovereignty. I'd show up to his, his room to pray for him and just to encourage him. He, he look, first thing he'd do, he could barely talk. He looked at me, he's talking about, Todd, you're wonderful. He's on his deathbed, not asking why. He's talking about, you're wonderful, Todd. I'm looking at me. You're like going, oh my goodness. I'm questioning. He's not even questioning. And I'm sure he went through internal struggles and had discussion with family. And I, I, I understand that. But man, that man lived it. And I'm so grateful for him. So much more to say. The question is, are you complaining to God? What is it looking like? What is it looking like in this season of your life? Final, final quote, John Corson, he said, many times as humans, we're more concerned with our temporary comfort. God's more concerned with our eternal state. Your body's temporal, but your soul, your spirit is eternal. We submit to his sovereignty. We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. Lord, thank you for opportunity to dive into your word, to discuss, to discover your heart. Even in these tough subjects, tough themes, you're comforting, you're maturing, you're illuminating. And I pray as a church, we continue to grow worshiping you in good times and in bad. Through the most gut-wrenching season or tragedy of our life, you're still God, and we honor you as God. Help us pour out our heart to you, be honest with you, authentic, but ultimately submit to your sovereignty and worship you even in the chaotic moments. I'm thankful that we have a God who has given us a word that never changes. It's steady. In this wild world, I continue to go back to your word. You are God. I am not. And I pray that would settle in really throughout the entire church. For your glory, God, I know there's a lot of people looking on, seeing how we're going to respond in our, in our toughest seasons as Christians. So help us model what it looks like to cry out, but not tap out. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I want to just briefly give an opportunity for any here that need to come to Christ today. In chapter 14 of Job, there was a, a verse that struck me, talking about questions, and Job says this, and Job 14, 14, he says, can the dead live again? If so, this would give me hope through all my years of struggle. I think one of the best parts of being a believer is no matter what happens, I got hope. I got hope that I'm gonna be chilling with Pastor Steve one day and we're gonna be catching up, man, just hanging out. I got hope that the dead will live again. Jesus, in John eleven twenty five, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. That's hope. Do you need that hope today? Do you need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, no matter what happens in my life, when I take my last breath here on this planet, it's my first breath in heaven. Do you need your sins forgiven? 
The Bible is clear. He's perfect. He's holy. None of us are. All have sinned and fallen short of God's standard of perfection. Romans 6, 23, but it's, it's such a beautiful thing. The, this, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Do you need eternal life? Let's stand together. And the band's gonna play this song. This is gonna be your opportunity at this moment to make peace with God. You say, man, I've been mad at God. I've ran from him. You don't know what I've done, pastor. There's no way he can forgive me. Can I tell you that's absolutely a lie. It doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. We got a great God. No condemnation in Christ. He wants to forgive you. Maybe you've strayed away from God. It's your time to come back. So as the band plays, as the church prays, if you don't absolutely have to be somewhere at church, I just invite you to lean in in this moment and pray for the person that just needs to give their life to Christ. Full surrender, full send, I'm all in. Not turning back. This is real. Not just for your eternal state, but man, your, your experience here on this planet as well. I promise you it's different. I've seen it time and time again. So as the band plays, you come forward. I'll lead you in a very simple but powerful prayer. God, open up my heart. I invite you inside. Forgive me of my sin. I wanna follow you. I want a relationship with you. I wanna take my seat at the table, be with you for eternity. We'll connect you with some people that will help you as you begin the journey. Your choice, God's hand is out. You respond, you come forward as the band plays, as the church prays. Come on up, I'm proud of you, come on up, come on. Everybody else, come on up. So proud of you, I love it. Come on. Anybody else, really proud of you. It's a good move. God's speaking to you. It doesn't matter what has happened, he wants to forgive, he wants to renew, he wants to refresh. Anybody else, we're not gonna sing anything right now actually. God's, God's moving. Maybe you're up in the nosebleeds. You're listening online. He's reaching out his hand to you. Rise out of that chair and you come forward. You might feel like you got some, some Velcro right there. Maybe your heart is beating right now. Just come forward. Join this young lady right here. We're gonna, we're gonna pray this prayer. It's gonna be your heart connecting with God. Anybody else? I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. 10 second buzzer, here we go. Fourth quarter, game's ending. And I'm fine if it's just you, I'm, I'm great with that. If you're ready, why don't, why don't you follow me in prayer? Why don't you pray out loud, say, Lord God, yep. I open up my heart. Yep. I invite you inside yep. to be my God, to be my savior, to be my friend. To be my friend! <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this seat at the table. Forgive me all my sins. Forgive me all my sins! <laughs> Wash me clean. Wash me clean. I've decided today to follow you, Jesus. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. I love it. Now listen, as I mentioned, I just have a couple of friends who want to give you a Bible and pray with you a little more. You okay with that? So you can head that direction right now. One more time for this young lady right here. Come on, somebody. Come on. So, right.